So good afternoon and welcome everybody at the final Heidelberg Joint Astronomy Colloquium of this calendar year. Uh, it is a real pleasure and an honor to welcome Saskia Hecker today. Uh, Saskia is a world leading expert on observational and theoretical studies of stellar evolution, the internal structure of stars and asteroid seismology. And Saskia is actually a new arrival here in Heidelberg because she joined HITS and Heidelberg University in September of this year. Uh, she started her career uh, with uh, receiving her PhD or doing her PhD at uh, Leiden Observatory, which she received in 2007. After that, Saskia became a postdoctoral researcher at the Royal Observatory of Belgium, and after that, uh, the University of Birmingham. She then returned to the Netherlands, uh, holding a Veni Fellowship at the University of Amsterdam, after which she started a, an independent research group at the Max Planck Institute for Solar System Research in Göttingen, which she led between 2013 and 2020. And then in 2014, uh, she became the head of the International Node of, stellar of the Stellar Astrophysics Center in uh, Denmark. And as I mentioned, as of this year, September this year, she is a professor here at Heidelberg University and a group leader at HITS. And today she is going to talk to us about red giant stars inside out. And as is the joint colloquium tradition, I would kindly like to ask all of you to unmute and give Saskia a very warm applause, a very warm welcome. Well, thank you very much for this very uh, extended introduction and the applause. I feel I can stop here right now, but as I have prepared and you like to hear more, I, I will, of course, give my presentation on the red giant stars inside out. Um, so um, this topic actually of looking inside stars is actually already quite old and it started actually in 1926 with Arthur Eddington, the famous Arthur Eddington saying, at first sight, it would seem that the deep interior of the sun and stars is less accessible to scientific investigation than any other region of the universe. Our telescopes may probe farther and farther into the depths of space, but how can we ever obtain certain knowledge of that which is hidden beneath substantial barriers? What appliance can peer through the outer layers of a star and test the conditions within? So even at that time in 1926, um, Arthur Eddington was thinking, how can we actually figure out the stellar structure and, and how can we know what is actually really happening in there? And at that time, there was no answer yet to this, but the answer is there uh, today and already for a few decades, and that is called astroseismology. And so what we do with astroseismology is essentially we use the, the normal or global modes of a star that the star does exhibit and we try to infer the internal structure using those modes. And on the left-hand side here, you see a very schematic structure of different modes that can propagate in the star. And you can see that there's different modes. Some propagate really from surface to surface, right through the star. Um, so some, some stars have a few nodal points or lines if we go in three dimensions on the surface and they probe the star very deep. Others have more nodal lines on the surface and so they, they are less deep and so essentially we can probe the, the, the surface layers. And so if you now see several of these different oscillations, you can see here, for instance, that we can probe very narrow regions in the star and by the difference in the properties of different modes, we can indeed probe the internal structure of the stars. So this is the answer to Arthur Eddington's problem that he raised in 1926. Um, Obviously, if we look at stars for the sun, we can see all these modes with very many nodal lines on the surface. For stars, this will not be possible. And we see more modes like the ones that you see here. Um, the radial oscillation mode is just where you expand and contract. Uh, so that's red and blue. Uh, and we can see modes with a few uh, nodal lines on, on, this, on the surface. Um, so that's the, the, the dipole mode with one nodal line on the surface and the quadrupole mode, which you see here in the bottom. Uh, with two nodal lines. Those are the white areas, essentially. Um, so this is what we can see for, for stars typically. And it's just because of we see the star as a point source and we can't resolve all these small nodal lines. Nevertheless, we get information about the structure of the star. 
So you may wonder, does all those stars um, oscillate? Um, and therefore I show here an, an HR diagram, uh, which I guess everybody is familiar with to some extent. So here in the background, all these small dots that are uh, real observations. Um, and we see the main sequence, the giant branch, and then also white dwarfs here. And on top of that, we see all these, these blobs with the different colors. And all these blobs are locations where stars do oscillate. And so it's across this HR diagram that stars can oscillate. Um, specifically here in this instability strip, I want to mention this is a strip where stars essentially evolve through different times of their lives. And then when they're in the strip, they do oscillate. But for instance, here outside this instability strip, they do not necessarily oscillate. So I will not discuss this whole uh, diagram for you today. My focus will be on the stars that are relatively cool, say below 6,700 in effective temperature. And these stars are similar in that they have a convective outer atmosphere. Uh, and this is the atmosphere in which they can actually drive the oscillations. So they're driven in the stochastic noise in the atmospheres. And so what I will discuss here, and it's also in my abstract, I will discuss a little bit about stars, the sun, or a little bit like the sun. And then I will also move up to the red giants, which are my, my prime focus throughout my research. So if we go to the sun, then we may want to look uh, what is actually happening in the, in the sun. So this um, is a um, Kippenhahn diagram of a one solar mass. So what we see here is H here on the x-axis and the mass on the y-axis. It's a one solar mass, so the relative mass is the same as the real mass. And if we now look, for instance, at this, this stellar model, of course, of two giga years, then we see that it has helium fusion going on here in the core, and it's a large radiative region, and then we have convection in the outer layers. And this does remain very similar throughout the main sequence life, which, which ends here roughly. Um, and then we see that, that, that the hydrogen fusion is not, no longer taking place really in the core, but in a shell around the core. Um, and, and this is at the first, it's a thick shell and then it becomes thinner. And roughly at the same time, also the uh, convection zone starts to deepen and a much bigger part of the star becomes convective. And then we enter here, the red giant branch region, which I have highlighted here on the right-hand side. You can see here's the thin layer of um, hydrogen shell burning. And here in red, we also have the helium fusion going on. So this is the helium flash, and then we have helium fusion. And then when the star evolves further, which I will not go into, we get also helium shell burning. So this is roughly what we think the evolution of, of a one solar mass star looks like um, and what the structure changes are. And what we now want to do with astro seismology is, is confirm that this is happening, but also seeing uh, what's happening, for instance, at edges between radiative and convective. Is there overshoot? How much overshoot is there? Um, that, that may have big implications, essentially, on the stellar evolution. If you have, for instance, um, already convection uh, in the pre-main sequence or in the main sequence in the core, this will get more hydrogen into the core and extend the main sequence lifetime of the star. And this will then mean that you have, you follow a different evolutionary track. This has also, again, implications if you use these stellar ages for galactic archaeology, for exoplanet studies, and so on and so forth. So therefore, I think this is a really relevant topic that we do study this. And here today, I would like to tell you a little bit how we do this and what we can actually do. So I will start out with a star that we observed, which is slightly further evolved than our sun. Um, of this star, we took uh, Kepler data. Kepler is a NASA-led mission, or was a NASA-led mission, that has been staring for four years at one field in the sky and observed there every 30 minutes. It got an integrated flux measurement. Um, and then you have a four-year-long time series. You can take the Fourier spectrum and what you see here is what you get. Um, so we have the frequency here on the um, x-axis and the power density uh, on the y-axis. And you can see a whole load of, well, there's noise, of course, but there's a whole load of peaks here, um, which in this case are labeled. And they are labeled by the number of nodal lines that they have on the surface, uh, these oscillation modes. 
And so we have the radial ones indicated with the zeros. Then we have the dipole mode, so one nodal line with the ones, and the quadrupole modes with the twos. And you can see that this is a very kind of regular pattern. So we have the zero, we have a one, then we have a two, we have a zero, one, two, zero, one, two, et cetera. And these differences in frequency are very equal. And so the difference in the um, radial modes is something that we call the large frequency separation. And this is immediately connected to the mean density of the star. So we can infer the mean density of the star. Um, there's also a typical frequency that this one is, is, is kind of a, well, it's not very clear, but it's kind of Gaussian shape here. Within the center, we have something that's called what we call the new max. And the new max is, is the, the typical or central frequency. And that's directly related to the surface gravity. So log G of the star. And so I think you can imagine that log G, so G is M over R squared. The mean density is M over R cubed. And so if we have those two measurements, we need a little bit of the in information on the temperature. We can get already an estimate of the mass and radius of the star. So these are therefore very important global properties. We have one more property that's indicated as a small frequency separation. That is the frequency between this two and the zero. Again, this is fairly stable per star. And this gives us an indication on the amount of, of hydrogen that's still left in the core. And therefore, this is a probe of the H of the star. Okay, so this is a star it's similar to the sun. The sun would have a frequency of about 3000 here and a period of about five minutes. So this is a bit lower frequency. So this is maybe a period of, I uh, didn't compute it, maybe 15 minutes or so. So now we go to a, a star that is slightly more evolved. And we look here, we have a similar pattern as we had, although here in the red circle, we see that there's two ones. So we have the, 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 the zero, one, there were two, and then the two, zero, one, two, zero, one, two, and it goes further. You also see that the frequency, so the typical frequency is 850 here. So that's lower, so the, the period is longer. Um, and this star is further evolved. So the reason that we have these two dipole modes here is actually because the structure of the star changed. And I would like to show that, do this uh, on this diagram. So if we look at the top part of the diagram, which says main sequence, you can see this is frequency on the, on the y-axis and we have the radius on the x-axis. And if we look, we have here a red box, and that is essentially the cavity where gravity modes could resonate. And then we have here the bluish area, and this bluish area is where the pressure modes could resonate. And then I have here a typical a bar with two horizontal lines, and this is typically the frequency of a main sequence star, so somewhere in this box. And you can see that this will only cross, so the, the, the oscillations can only propagate if they're either be above the red line and the, the blue dashed line, so completely in this area, or be below both of them, so in the red area. And you can see the main sequence star will oscillate in the area where we have uh, pressure modes, and so we have nice pressure modes, nothing, very simple, we got this nice pattern that I showed you. If then the star evolves, what happens is essentially the core contracts and the density increases, which you can see back here in this Brunvasela frequency in the red, this peaks here more gets higher values. Um, and on the other hand, the star expands. And this means that the Brunvasela, the, the, the lamp frequency, which is this blue line here, goes down. And so now the frequency at which we can have oscillations overlaps with both a blue, a red area here in the core and a blue area. So a wave could resonate in two parts here with a small area in between, which we call an evanescent zone. And now it happens that the modes can kind of tunnel through or couple through this evanescent zone. And so we have now modes that have, they come from the inside and from the outside. So they're called mixed modes because they have a mixed character. And this is what you see in this figure. This is such a mixed mode, and therefore we see two here. And they are very interesting because they, they are the first modes that really probe the core because this red area is really in the core. So if we then evolve further, 
um, we get this power spectrum. So again, the frequency is here at about 125 or so, much lower period gets up to an hour, maybe two hours. Um, and here we have again the same, the same pattern, 0, 2, 1, 0, 2, I'm sorry, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2. But you see that the ones are not one mode. They're actually a whole forest of mode, if you will. Um, and again, if you go back to this figure, you can see the core has contracted further for the red giant branch. The outer layers have expanded further. And so there's a lot more overlap in the frequency range between the cavity where the gravity modes can oscillate here in red and the cavity where the pressure modes can oscillate in blue. And so we will have many more modes. You may wonder why it's only the dipole modes which have this, so the modes with one. Um, well, first of all, the radial modes do not have a gravity component, so they can't do this, uh, this coupling. Um, the quadrupole modes here with a two, they do the same thing essentially, but they will be closer together, the peaks in which they split, and we don't have the resolution to see that here. So it is more an observational bias that we don't see it, or in most stars we don't see it, than that this is something fundamental. It is there, but it's much harder to detect. Okay, so the question now is, so we know these, all these modes, they essentially give us information from the core, as I just explained. And so now the question is, how can we extract some information from the core? Because that's in the end what we want. So, Therefore, I want you to look at these two different power spectra. So they have their both stars from Kepler. So they have this kick telephone number. Their typical frequency, this one is kind of 85. This one is 100, slightly different, but not tremendously different. Then we have these zeros, the large frequency separation, which I talked about. Uh, this one has a value of eight and one point, uh, the other one is 7.89. Again, ballpark the same. Um, then we look at these frequencies in the ones, and I can show that maybe better here. So we have outlined these um, two power spectra such that the zero modes overlap, so that they, you can see how similar they actually are. And if you now focus on the dipole modes, you can see that these look actually quite different. So here, it's maybe hard to see. There are some different peaks, but it's hard to, to recognize. Well, here it's very clear. We, we, I don't think there's much dispute of there being there one and there and there and there. So it's very different. So if we now measure this difference between these peaks, not in frequency this time, but in period, you can see that this one has a difference in period between the different peaks in this red box of 53 seconds. And this one, if we do the same exercise and we measure the difference in these peaks in this box, we have 96 seconds that's about a factor of two. And that is a very significant dis difference. And if we do this for many more stars, um, then we can see that essentially, we plot this difference in this period against this frequency separation between the, the, the radial modes, we do see two distinct groups. This group here in the top is the, are the stars on the, where the core helium burning has started. So they are on a red clump in red or the secondary clumps so are the more massive stars that did not go through a helium flash. And they are up here. And we have these blue points here. And those are the ones that are still in the hydrogen shell burning phase ascending the red giant branch. So what we've done now, we have essentially taken information from the core and we could separate out the stars in two different evolutionary phases. And these stars are otherwise very similar. So if you look at an HR diagram of many stars, those stars will overlap. And that's because the surface is very similar. Certainly if you take slightly mass and, and metallicity differences into account, they're in the same spot, but their core is different. And now we have information from the core and we can see that difference. The reason, the physical reason why this is so different is visible in this figure. So I come back here essentially to this lamp frequency and that's in the, um, the dashed line here. So this area was the blue area in the previous plot above this dashed line. 
And then we have in the solid lines, we have the areas under the Brunvasela frequency, which is the blue area in the previous plot where the gravity modes can oscillate. I've now changed the colors for the black. In black, I have a model for a red joint branch star. And in red, I have a model for a torhelion burning star. And in blue here, I have now the uh, area where the frequencies are to be expected. And you can see that certain, certainly these solid lines are very different. So the black solid line here, so the brunt vasela frequency has a positive, I'm very sorry, has a positive value um, in the deep interior, while for the red area, there is, it's imaginary, so it's, it's not visible here. The reason for that is, is that the brunt vasela frequency or the cavity where we have the gravity modes can only be there when it's not convective. And if a star ascending the red giant branch has an inert non-convective core, well, if a star goes into helium core burning, the core becomes convective. And that's what you see here. And that is what makes the period spacing so different. So we have a real physical reason why we understand what the differences is. So it's, we can't see the burning, but we can see the effects of the burning. So, to get the evolutionary stages, which is very important if you, for instance, want to use the red clump as a distance indicator or so, um, we need to have long time series data to resolve these modes that I just showed you. I mean, this, is, this could only be done when we had at least one year of data, um, which is a long time. And if we want to do this for galactic archeology span studies, this may be a bit too long. And the current mission, like the TESS mission, has also shorter data sets, and we would like to do it there too. Therefore, we developed also a method to go into the time series and train um, a gradient boosted tree classifier to, based on the time series, get the evolutionary states. And we used the results that I just showed you to kind of um, calibrate that or train that. And what we use from the time series is the number of zero crossings the variance of the time series, the variance of the time series of the first differences, and also a psi parameter, psi squared, I indicated this here. And that essentially is a parameter that distinguishes between the noise and a sinusoidal signal. Um, and so we can essentially see how much the signal looks like noise or how much a signal looks like a sinusoid and then everything in between. In addition to this information from the time series, we also didn't want to uh, neglect the fact that Gaia um, has been published. At least this was Gaia DR2 that we used. DR3 is not incorporated yet as it came out, I think, last week. Um, but we use this information and uh, we then can classify also um, the red giant stars in their different categories. But we can actually do a little bit more. And I have, if the plot will load, and one figure where we have looked essentially at all stars um, that were for which we had time series data. And we plot here the, norm, the number of normalized zero crossings on the x-axis. And we this psi squared parameter on the y-axis, where here the zero indicates essentially noise. And the higher the value, the more coherent the signal is. And you see a very interesting structure here. So the color is just the number density. And you see here a very, very clear strand going up. These are the more coherent oscillators, these ones. And then here, the strand, which is not as clear, that goes up and actually crosses over here. Um, those are solar-like oscillators, so the ones that we are interested in. We have also some scatter here up there. This is eclipsing binaries, because um, in our classifier, sometimes you see for the eclipsing binary, the binary signal sometimes the oscillating signal is dominant. So this is one of these kind of double classes, which is harder to see. <clears throat> but, but this is, um, I think, a very beautiful result that we can clearly, from the time series alone, um, see what the different uh, uh, phenomena are that happen. And if we then zoom in on the, the part where we have the red giants, um, so we plot here the number of normalized zero crossings on the y-axis, and the, the, the variance on the, the x-axis. And you can see that we can classify different parts of, of the red giant branch. So we have the low luminosity RGB. So they're on the, the lower part. Uh, then we have the, the confusion region, as we call it. 
because these are stars where the red giant branch is essentially overlapping with uh, the, the red clump, the red clump, uh, and then we have the high luminosity stars. And we also included some noise sources because the stochastic oscillations have some noise features. And so you can see, we can do this. We have a success rate of more than 90% to get the evolutionary stages. Um, and we can do this on 27 uh, days of test data. And that was the purpose. So it's the success rate is, is not 100%, that won't be, but we can apply this to much shorter time series where the other method by using these mixed modes is not applicable. So I think this is still um, a very positive result. So I would then like to go back um, to this figure where we looked really into the core of the star. And we already saw that this convection area here uh, makes a big difference in this period spacing. <clears throat> and so we can learn something from that. We can also see on this side there are significant differences. And, and we have not gotten as far in investigating those. That is certainly work for the future. Uh, but I just want to highlight here that, that we have now the information to do so. so the first thing is, is that this, this, this dotted line here in, is indicating the evanescent zone, so the, 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 the area essentially where the um, oscillation cannot propagate but is damped out. And you can see that this is much larger here in the, the, the black case, so for the RGB star, than it is in the red case for the Corhelion burning star. And so this means that there's a difference in the coupling because we have a bigger kind of area that needs to be bridged, and so there's a difference in the coupling. Uh, and this is what we also found. So here we have the coupling factor. It's, it's uh, the, the real coupling factor in, is indicated here in the top and the natural log of it is in the bottom. And you can see these blue, red and, and black dots are indicating three models. So the, um, uh, every frequency has essentially in theory at least a different coupling factor. And you can see this is quite a lower number and here, all these different colors are the Corhelion burning star, so that's a much higher number. So because the area that it needs to bridge is smaller, you get a better coupling and so a higher coupling factor. And you can see here that indeed this is related to the radial extent of this, this kind of evanescent zone. So here we can, in theory, and we're working on getting that out of the data, we can find what is actually the evanescent zone, what's the width of the evanescent zone, and so we can learn something on the, the, the properties of the star in that region. Another thing that we could look at, um, and I go back to this figure, is you can see that, for instance, here in the red one, the, um, the derivative here on the Brunvasela frequency on the solid line and on the dashed line is fairly equal. But, but if you now look at the difference in the derivative here for the black one, that's very different. And so there is a difference in that we, we captured that in the local density contrast at the edge of the core. Uh, this is essentially this difference in this um, derivatives. Um, and if we put that here for the three RGB models that we had in this publication, you can see that there is clearly a trend going on. We can also, if we measure our waves, we have obviously, we have a phase factor or, or an offset. And we did measure that for these three models as well. And we do find a correlation there. Um, work. This is from 2018. We are working um, on getting many more models and stars to, to measure this. Another group has some evidence that indeed from this offset, this phase offset, we can get some information on the edges of both the uh, gravity cavity and the pressure cavity. So again, from the briefs that we get, we can use this information to really tackle something about the internal structure of the stars. Um, and so this is all work in progress and we think we can do more. Uh, we also would like to look at this peak here, for instance, is the hydrogen shell. Maybe we can also say something about that. Now we are really sensitive to this area, but again, that is future work that we want to tackle here in the, in the TOS group here at HITS. Another phenomenon that we have been studying on the red giant branch is the, the bump. So what you see here is a, a solar track, a, a stellar track, one solar mass. Um, so these are the earlier stages, main sequence. You go up to the subgiant branch and you go up the, the giant branch. 
and then here in H is the red clump. But on the red giant branch, you can see that there is this kind of people call it also a glitch. So while you you cool and increase your luminosity, at some point you decrease for a, a wee bit, and then you continue your increase in cooling. This feature is well known. There's not, nothing peculiar in the sense that every model, every solar one mass, one solar mass model, do, does this. Uh, in that sense, there is really no issue. Also, if we look at, for instance, a, a large set of data with stars around this, we can see that the, the, the density of stars is much higher at this evolutionary stage, showing what we see here, that we expect more, more stars there. So there is essentially no problem. The only thing is that we do not really understand how it comes about. What we do know is that in the beginning, I told you that the convection zone goes in, this is called a dredge up at some point, it doesn't go deeper anymore, but it starts receding. And when it does that, it leaves a mean molecular weight discontinuity because in the convective area, the, the, the mean molecular weight is of course, is, is the same everywhere due to the convection because of the radiative region below that there, it is not mixed and so the, the the mean molecular weight is different and there's a step. And it was always thought, okay, as soon as the hydrogen shell burned through this step, we get the bump. That is not exactly true because it has been shown in 20, 2005, uh, 2015 already, that actually that happens only here at point F. So only there, the hydrogen shell burned through the mean molecular weight as continuity. But why is point E there then? This is a real question and we have been looking at this over the past year and we found at least some ideas of what could happen. And for this, we looked really at the, the entropy of the star. So what we do here, we look again in a, some kind of a um, Kippenhahn diagram. So we have the H here on the X axis. We have again E and F, this is the, the bump, the same E and F that we had in the previous one, E and F. And we have, again, the mass axis here. Um, so we, we look quite deep into the star between 0.15 and 0.35 um, in mass. And this is a one solar mass model again. And then we have here, this, this black line indicates where we have essentially the maximum burning of, of the hydrogen. Then we have here in blue, we have the um, base of the convection zone and we can see it gets deeper and deeper and deeper in mass. And then at some point it comes up and it gets less deep. This, this dashed line, this dashed blue line is the mean molecular weight discontinuity. And you can indeed see that only disappears or this only hits the black line at F. So at the end, what, what I said and what was discovered prior already. <clears throat> Sorry. So what we now looked is at, we looked essentially at the mirror of the star. And the mirror is fairly vaguely defined as the fact that the core contracts and the surface expands. So we looked at two different variables there, and that is the um, epsilon g is zero. So absolute g is the graphothermal uh, uh, energy potential. And we looked where it is zero. So essentially this is the, the boundary between compression and expansion. And that's the orange line. We also, and we call this the pivot. We also looked at the stationary point, and that is the point where the velocity, the inward velocity, and the outward velocity where the velocity is zero. So there's no inward or outward moving. And we, we can see here that for the, this is, is all um, at decent values here, but at point E, it shoots up and essentially both the red and the, the, the orange line disappear. They go to the surface. This means there is no mirror in this, this small interval in the star in a small um, um, part of the evolution. And so the whole star is essentially contracting. So there is no part expanding anymore. Everything is contracting at that phase. And so we have looked at this um, and, and found that the mean molecular weight discontinuity actually is vital. So although it's not burning through, but it is exhibit, um, sorry, I'm losing the word here. It's, it's provide, uh, preventing the specific entropy from increasing. It needs to increase continuously to keep these borders here. And it doesn't do that. And that is due to the, the mean molecular weight discontinuity. So essentially at this point, the star senses this discontinuity already 
in its entropy and therefore we lose the mirror and we get the bump. So this is for the moment a toy model. So I'm not saying this is the truth. This is the toy model that we described in our paper earlier this year. And this is what we now want to also work on to prove that this is how the bump comes about. And why this is actually interesting? Well, the problem is I told you that the bump is there in models and the bump is there also in observations. However, not at the same position. So what you see here is three um, different isochrones in the three different colors. Um, and this is the absolute magnitude that we find. Uh, and these, all these uh, black dots here, are, those are the observations. And clearly there's a discrepancy between the position of the bump in the models and the position of the bump in the, in the observations. And so therefore, some, probably some physics is missing in the models. And by now understanding what the bump is and how, what it's causing it, we try to understand what physics is missing and where we can update the models. And this is very important because also the bump is used as kind of an anchor point in many researches also for clusters and so on and so forth. Um, another way of looking into it is, is also looking at an inverse problem. So what I have been talking about so far is mostly the forward problem. We have a set of data we compute a model and we check, does this model fit for the data? No, it doesn't. Then we compute another model and then we fit again and we see, and then we find in this way a best fit model to the data, which is a very good and, 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 and often used approach. However, we can also do the other side. We can say, okay, we have the data here and we do an inverse problem and we see which model fits best or how how a best fit model actually fits. So this is the inverse problem. So we just take the data and say, this model should do it. Um, this has been developed actually for the sun and has had good uh, results. And for the sun, this is like the diffusion, amount of diffusion in the sun and the rotation profile of the sun has been always determined using this inverse problem. That was not been possible with the forward problem. So what we have done over the past <coughs> four years, we also tried to do this for other stars and we had some success there. Um, we need a lot of observations, so certainly not something we can do for all stars, uh, but we did it for 66A and 66B. Those are solar-like stars, um, relatively similar to our sun, uh, for which we had excellent Kepler data. And what you can see here is on the y-axis is the sound speed difference. So we, what we tried to do is we take a model, which we think is a best fit model, uh, and we then see how different this sound speed in this model should be if we take the data. And so we have done this for those two stars, and you can see here for 66b, well, all the points lie very nicely along the zero line. So zero is the best fit model is indeed fitting very well, and the physics that we put in seems to work. But for 166A, there's still, there is some discrepancy, which may or may not be significant. Uh, we also did this uh, for a star with a convective core. And you can see, this is again, the, 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 the relative sound speed difference. And you can see this goes up to 10% uh, and has clearly a very steep slope. So this really means some physics is actually missing in here. Um, we tried to see if diffusion or overshoot would solve this issue. Uh, as you can see, the effects of different overshoot and diffusion prescriptions and values does not account for this whole difference. I mean, it may be a little bit, but doesn't account for it. So again, we are having to really see what physics is missing here. At the moment, we don't have a clue, but this is again work for, for the future. <clears throat> So another thing that we can do and where we can look really inside the red giant stars is when we look at the oscillations. So what we show here is um, three um, stars with um, oscillation modes. The, the middle one, this oscillation mode is actually not in the direction of the travel, uh, of the, 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 the rotation. It's, it's in the other direction, it's perpendicular to it. Uh, and on the outside, the modes are either traveling with the rotation or against the rotation. <clears throat> and what you see that is happening is that if you travel with the rotation, 
then your period changes becomes longer. And if you travel against the rotation, your period becomes shorter. So we essentially, this is splitting of modes. So like a Zeeman splitting, you can see two or three modes. And you can see that this is also changing. The amplitudes are changing on the way we look at it. So here we have the rotation axis. Those is the arrow. Um, and we can see the different inclination angles that just pass by. And so when we have a 90 degrees, we can only see the outward modes. But if we then go to um, uh, like 45 degrees, then we have three modes that we can see. And if we go to an inclination angle 10 or lower, we can essentially only see the central mode. So if we see mode splitting, we can say something about the, uh, the, the, the rotation, but also about the inclination angle that we're looking at. And I don't want to go too deep into this, but what we have been doing um, is that we, we looked at, at the, the, the mixed modes. So again, these modes that probe also the evolutionary state. And we can see here that if we look at this, I'll explain the, the symbols. So the, the squares here, those are the radial modes. The triangles are the quadrupole modes, so the twos, and all these dots are the ones. So we have one, two, zero, one, two, zero, again. So we have the same pattern. We then look carefully here at these ones, we see that they're split. And so we can measure this, uh, the splitting. And so we've done that and we can see that that is not constant. So not all of these modes have the same splitting, although they're, in, they're very close together, you can see it's kind of a V shape. And that is because the modes that are here in the center, those are the modes that have kind of the highest weight towards the surface. Well, if we move away from that, we get modes that are more sensitive to the core. And so what we can see here is that the rotation in the core is not the same as the rotation on the surface. And indeed, if we then, um, for instance, if we would look at the solid body rotation, then we would get more of a head shape. Um, but if we let the, ro the core rotate faster than the surface, we get the V shape. So this was the discovery paper of finding the differential, radial differential rotation um, in red giant stars, uh, where the core rotates about 10 times faster than the surface. More work has been done. Um, we see that this happens indeed on the subgiant branch, it's about five times faster in the core, and then um, towards uh, the, the red giant branch, it stays like this. The interesting thing is actually that models are an order of magnitude off, so we can't model this. We can observe it, we can't model it at the moment. So to finish this off, um, I would like to just show you a kind of fun thing, which I think just is fun, and I thought to include it here. When we observe the stars, we sometimes see a power spectrum like this, where we don't see one star, but we actually see two stars here, star A and star B, as we, we dubbed it, we have no clue. And so if we look at the, when we remove this background and so on, we can clearly see that there are two different sets of oscillations and they belong to different stars. There's no question about this. These are two different stars. If you then look in the Gaia data, indeed, we do find two different stars. So the question is, what is this? Is this a chance alignment? Are these binaries or anything else? So we have been checking and if we look here, uh, at the parallaxes and the probability distributions from the Gaia, and this is DR2, then in black we have the Gaia data, and in, in uh, blue we have star A, and in red we have star B. And we have tried to, we don't really know which one is star A, if that is that one or that one, so we, we mix them matched, but you can see there's a the dashed line to indicate that, but it doesn't really matter. We can't really distinguish. Maybe these are at the same distance, Maybe not. We did a quick check on the Gaia DR3 already, but that doesn't give us much more information. So astroseismology is also a way in which we can, for instance, find new binaries that are maybe very difficult to see with radial velocities. They are not eclipsing, but they are binaries, the astroseismic binaries. In this case, we call this paper to be or not to be a binary, so we don't know in this case, but um, it's, a, it's an interesting thought. So summarizing this, um, the red giant stars inside out, I think I've shown that we are starting to have inferences of stellar cores and it is possible, a long way still to go, but I think in the next 10 to 20 years, we will learn much, much more than we did already. 
Uh, we also showed that we find discrepancies with the stellar models between the data that we analyze. And I think this is the way to improve the physics in stellar models, which is something I think that has always been the promise of asteroid seismology. And we are now getting to uh, really get to that promise and do it. And I think this will have large impact into fields like galactic archaeology, even galaxies where you use models of stars, but also into the exoplanet fields. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Saskia. That was a really fascinating talk. And I, uh, yeah, I opened the floor for questions. And while, uh, so as, as every week, please uh, use the raise hand function here in Zoom. Uh, in the meanwhile, I have a, I have a first question, which is, um, so I, one of the main reasons that I'm interested in astro seismology is, is because of the potential to help constrain stellar ages. And I think there, there is a related question here, because a lot of the features that you highlighted occur at specific ages, which I suppose might shift a little bit at different metallicities, and of course also as a function of mass. To me, that suggests that in order to compare models and observations, you really need to, to try an age date very well. How, how do you make that comparison? How do you know that you're picking the right model in the right part of parameter space to compare to a star or a certain subset of stars? Um, so, uh, so you should see it as this, that the astro-scientific measurements gives you additional constraints. I mean, you may observe your log G, your temperature, your metallicity, we use those. So it is not that this replaces any of that, this is additional. So for instance, if we use this uh, large frequency separation, which is a measure of the mean density and the, the new max, which is kind of a measure of the radius or log G, we have a fair idea of, of, of where we should look in the HR diagram. So um, there is, that degeneracy is not there. Mm -hmm. uh, it is maybe there if you don't know the evolutionary state. What we then often do is we say, okay, we assume now in our models that's an RGB. So we will only search in the RGB um, range for the best age and mass. And we give that value. We also do this in the, the, the cohelium burning and we give two different because if you mix that up, then you don't know what you're doing. So um, if then there is a fair, the different methods I presented here too, but there are more around to distinguish an evolutionary state, then you know what you can use. So in that sense, the degeneracy with these additional constraints is actually lifted to a certain extent, at least. So even though uh, sort of the mixing and matching and, and also say an age measurement is still model dependent, it's basically the com combination of different angles through which you can increase the precision. Yeah, the, 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 the age determination is in this astro seismology is model dependent. Yeah. Um, you can't get around that. Okay, very clear. Thank you. Uh, Uli, please go ahead. No. Um, no you're unmuted. The, the, the little sky map was shown a bit too briefly. So uh, my question, what is the angular distance between the two of, of this pair? Oh, um, I can't tell you that on top of my heart. I, I have to look into the paper. Uh, I see. It's uh, it's about three arc seconds. Ah, is this? Ah, I was wondering why you don't observe them separately. But this is Kepler, and Kepler is defocused on purpose, right? Uh, yeah. Um, ah, yeah. You know, it's not. It's more defocused, but but the Kepler pixels are just too large. And this is the Gaia image that I show here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering. Okay, it's it's about three arc seconds, and that is not resolved by Kepler then. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, second question: Is this uh, has this uh, talk been recorded? I can't answer that question. I have to put that to Diederik. Diederik, it is currently being recorded. Yes. Oh, fine. So, it, will it become visible? Because yes. yeah, much of it, good. much of it was too quick for me, but I would like to understand. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Otherwise, I'm also available on email or any other means. So if there's other questions that you figure yeah, out that, you want to ask later, then please contact me. That, that gives you extra work while the recording doesn't. I appreciate you watching the recording first, yes. But then still, I'm open to answer questions. Uh, Christian, please. Hi, Saskia. Uh, Hi. I have a question now. You were talking about uh, evolved stars on, on the sun. Can you apply this kind of method also for young stars, you know, to observe, let's say, Titawi stars, measure rotation rates, or something like this? Um, 
So there is astroseismology done on young stars. I am not sure about Titawi stars. Um, I know they are working on kind of young Delta Scuti stars and those kind of things. So I, I know there is work being done on that. Uh, the difficulty is that those stars are typically very active and activity is essentially decreasing the, the amplitudes of the modes in many cases. So there is always a kind of, of, of trade-off there, what, what we can do. Also, this is only valid what I talked to you about today for the stochastic excited solar-like oscillators. If you look at more uh, coherent oscillators, which also exist, but it was not a topic of today, and then this becomes a bit different. So um, yes, we can do young stars, not as elaborate as we can do it here, but there's work on that done on that. Um, but you have to have long time series of uh, observations. Okay, so young stars are only, so many of them are quite magnetized. So that maybe plays also a, quite a role for the, for the modes. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Then, then typically what we see is that the magnetic activity diminishes the modes. Okay, thank you. Andreas, please go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, that was great. Um, I wanted to come back to your last slide where you said that um, there's a way to improve the physics in stellar models. And one of the things that you showed, for instance, is that you can measure the size of evanescent zones. And you are also you have other views into the interiors of stars. And perhaps the a big embarrassment is that 60 years later, we still use overshoot parameters and mixing length to describe turbulence. Can astroseismology help us to do the next step in so, understanding turbulence? So, I mean, we, we, we won't help to understand turbulence in the sense that um, the turbulence actually in our way, if we want to compare the model frequencies to the observed frequencies, the fact that we use this 1D um, mixing length theory is in the, the, in the adi adiabatic region, it's fine. It's actually, it actually doesn't bother us, but it's close to the surface where it's non-adiabatic. There it gives us an, an offset, a frequency dependent offset, which is something we're struggling with. So maybe this offset can, in retrospect, also help us to help with the turbulence. I think where we have more impact is on finding um, the overshoot and the, these prescriptions. Yeah. Um, what we see, which I didn't show, but if you look at these period spacings and the observed ones and the modeled ones, again, there's an offset. So uh, the observed ones are much larger than the modeled ones. We, we can't get there with the models. And so there is certainly something, do we have to make, have bigger convective cores, but how do we make bigger convective cores? But maybe it's also on the other end, and, and, and is there something in the base of the convection zone? So I think there is really room where we can learn something. So I think the effect of astroseismology will be bigger there. But this is all part of my ERC grant. Yeah, so it's within the framework, determine better parameters, but not necessarily a way to, to really go to a new paradigm. Um, I think that is at this stage difficult to answer which way. Um, I, I think, the, the paradigm of overshoot is by itself is, is not so bad. I mean, we're still stuck with 1D models and, and we have to do some parameterizations and these big beasts you can't model in 3D, at least not in the next 10, 20 years, I'm sure. Um, but, but maybe we, we, there's no step function. It, it's, it, there's another shape um, that we should use. Um, so what often is also used is that the overshoot of the core and the base, the convection zone is taking the same value just because that's easier in models, which is obviously there's no physical reasons to do that. We've done some work on that and showed that indeed this is not what you should do. Um, so I think there are a lot of steps in between before we really get rid of this paradigm or maybe optimize it. So I, I find that that's still an open end there. Okay, thanks. Thank you. That was actually a question I had myself as well. So I really enjoyed the conversation there. Uh, Richard, please, next question. Hello, thank you very much. Um, I have a question from a complete outsider. Um, what is the closest distance to the galactic center that you can do this astro seismology on red giant stars? Can you, for example, go up into the bulge of higher galactic latitudes 
and see something which is maybe only a kiloparsec away from the graphic center? Um, I don't think we reached that far. Um, we have done some tests on the distances. Um, it, it, we, we mostly limited at some point with the um, apparent magnitude. So there is because then the missions are limited to that. I'm sure we can get to three kiloparsec from here, from the, from the satellite. So that is not all the way to the galactic center. Also, of course, the galactic center is a bit busy. So I, I, I would say we can do something. I think we have some bulge stars certainly done, um, but I, I would have to look that up. But I think we have halo stars, we have bulge stars, uh, we have disk stars. That's all in, but not that close to the galactic center. Thank you. So uh, are there any further questions? Just giving a final round uh, before I have two logistical announcements. And of course, at the end, when we thank Saskia again. Uh, so first, um, of course, normally we would have now gone out for drinks and dinner with the speaker. Uh, we can't do that under the current circumstances. So yeah, you have a drink already. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, if anybody would like to follow up, uh, discuss further, of course, we have Saskia with us now in Heidelberg. So once the restrictions are lifted, I'm sure we can return to in-person conversations, but also indeed, if you have further questions, please do not hesitate to uh, drop Saskia or me a line by email. I expect a dinner at a later time. <laughs> we will get to dinner at a later time. Let's do it that way. Excellent. Um, yeah, so uh, then the one thing uh, left to do here is I would like to well, steal the screen sharing. I would like to uh, announce our next speaker and that will be after the Christmas break is going to be on January 12th and we'll again have a local speaker uh, Laura Kreidberg who just started as a new director at MPIA will be talking to us about hot takes on cool worlds exoplanet atmosphere characterization in the 2020s and as I mentioned in between we're going to have Christmas so uh, I do wish everybody a very happy uh, holidays as far as possible under the restrictions that were announced yesterday. Uh, please all stay healthy, stay safe, and let us all thank, unmute again, and thank Saskia for a wonderful talk and a beautiful closing of this academic, of this calendar year's uh, joint colloquium. Thank you.